as we begin to do this presentation, I'd like to have everybody take a fabulous look at some of the changes found on the forest floor over time. This will get us ready for an insider's report of what's in a view. Wow, that was amazing to see just one view found along the Blue Ridge Parkway and the changes that are found throughout the year, throughout several years, uh, looking at that one spot on the parkway. You know, the Blue Ridge Mountains are one of the most biodiverse places in the temperate world. The Blue Ridge Parkway is one of the most diverse parks found in the entire National Park Service, and we're lucky to have it here in our backyard. This webinar series, the Insider's Report, we have a special guest speaker today, Peter Hamill. He's the Ridge District Interpreter on the Blue Ridge Parkway. And one of his favorite hobbies is to go out on the parkway and take pictures showing the changes found in and along these mountains. And what a better time than fall to look at the changes that happen as you watch the colors wash down the faces of the mountains. It's extraordinarily beautiful this time of year. And so Peter's going to give us an insider's report of looking at some of the biodiversity found along these mountains. So without any further ado, I'm going to welcome Peter. Before we get started, I want you to look at the bottom of your screen and there's a little Q&A. You can click that and you can submit questions during the presentation and we'll get to as many of those at the end of the talk as we can. So once again, everyone, welcome to this insider's report from the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation of what's in a view. And Peter, welcome and take us inside the Blue Ridge Parkway to see what changes occur in and along these mountains. Well All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am going to start screen sharing. It's gonna take just a second um, to get this up. And do you have uh, the Parkway for All Seasons full screen? Can you see that, Carolyn? There you go, perfect. All right. Um, like Carolyn said, I'm the Ridge District Interpreter here on the Blue Ridge Parkway. I've been here since about 2010, and uh, somewhere as part of my Virginia and Master Naturalist class, I fell in love with photography, uh, particularly uh, time-lapse photography and trying to document things going on. Um, it really helps me look at the world in a different way. Um, when I was little, I grew up in the southeastern forest and just played in the woods all day long. I always wanted to work outside and uh, got one of my first jobs was actually forest inventory. And the irony is I didn't appreciate the woods when I lived and grew up here in the east. Uh, you know, when you see something every day, you kind of get used to it and you stop appreciating it for what it is. And uh, one, one of my major goals for working for the Park Service was try and travel around the country and see different landscapes and experience different habitats and learn the stories collectively of our country. Uh, my first job ended up being in Yellowstone National Park uh, back in um, 1998. And I was fortunate to work there for about four summers on the first stint and about two and a half years my second stint. In the winter time, I would go down to the Everglades National Park and work down there. I just love birds. And I couldn't think of a better place to experience uh, bird life than in uh, those wetlands that are down there and a lot of the wading birds uh, that are there. 
in some of the cool forests, especially mangrove forests that you don't see most places in the United States. Uh, in 2002, we moved up to Alaska and I got to work in Denali National Park for about three years. And uh, that was a, a tremendous change. If you think about South Florida, we left there in early April of 2002 and arrived in Denali in late April of 2002 for quite a, a shock uh, to our system. And then uh, got my first permanent job in Katmai National Park, which a lot of people know for the salmon and the, the bears feeding on those fish uh, there. But it's also a volcanic park. It's a really neat story about wilderness and the importance of parks as they change and adapt uh, to each generation. Um, through my travels, um, I've tried to visit as many different national parks as I could. These places are truly some of our most extraordinary natural landscapes and some of our most important historical uh, lessons as well. Uh, the red stars sort of um, illustrate where I've visited so far. You can see I got a lot of parks to go. Uh, and then the blue ones are the places that I've been fortunate enough uh, to work in. Um, but through all that time from 98 till about 2010, I began to realize how much I missed the East. Uh, in particular, I had never appreciated the fact that some places may not have trees. And as you travel the country, you're going to find places that don't have trees at all. And I was just amazed at the number of landscapes that you can go to that are devoid of tree life for one reason or another. Too much water, not enough water, not the right kind of water. Um, it was really an eye-opening experience to that. In addition, you can go visit places where the forest that was there has been removed for one reason or other, farm fields or city or whatever it is. And it really gave me a much better appreciation uh, for just having the forest canopy overhead and what that meant and how much that trees, you know, to me, I had so many fond memories of trees. I imagine all of you, if you start thinking about some of your favorite memories, uh, especially those that pertain to trees, the more you think, the more you'll realize uh, some of those value and the benefit of having trees in your lives. Uh, trees can be really inspirational, you know, and give you good perspective on life, um, just how big we might be in the landscape. And every time you think you've seen it all, you can go to a different place and you get an all new perspective about your scale and your place in the world. Um, I have not been to see the sequoia trees yet. That's on my list. And it was sort of canceled out by COVID this year as a lot of us have uh, experienced those, those changes. So I'm hoping one day to, to get out to California and see these monstrous trees. Um, but other trees, you know, when you think about it, uh, growing up, you develop relationships with the forest, you know, whether you want to climb trees or live in the trees in your own tree house. Um, you think about some of the benefits that we get from trees, some of our favorite foods come from trees, you know, the, the American apple pie, as it were, uh, in the parkway has a tremendous number of apple trees that are out there in the forest from the old farmsteads uh, scattered along the ridges. Um, you think about sitting around campfires and telling stories in the warmth that trees provide as you burn them. You know, everybody says firewood warms you twice, once when you cut it, the second time when you burn it. But I think it's the smell of the campfire that really strikes me as a, a fond memory. You think about some of our traditions are, are focused around trees as well. And, uh, you know, and how we uh, experience and interact with the landscape. Um, our relationship with trees changes over time too. Uh, you know, as you're young, you want sort of a mellow experience. And then as you get a little bit older, you look for a more adventurous experience out of trees. Uh, and then, you know, as you become more reflective, you are able to find uh, trees that then give you a chance to slow down and kind of enjoy the world with more stability and diversity. Um, and it's really the diversity of trees that stands out to me in the fall. Um, a lot of times it can be hidden uh, in the, the sea of green, as it were. Um, but just take a minute, I want you to look at both of these pictures and see if you can decide which one of these uh, pictures has more species of trees in it. And for context, the top picture is of the James River picnic area. It's about a half acre large. And the bottom photo is of Yellowstone National Park, which is about 2.2 million acres. And as most of you probably guessed, it was a trick question. Um, the bottom photo of Yellowstone National Park has about nine species of trees throughout that entire park, where the top photograph had 13 species of trees in just a small half acre. If you look across the entirety of the Blue Ridge Parkway, we have some 126 different kinds of trees that have been identified. And so the parkway is about a 22nd the size of Yellowstone, yet has 13 more times uh, the species of trees that you can find here. 
One of the really interesting things that Yellowstone taught me is that the sea of green, when you look at evergreen species, they kind of have the same shade to them all year. Now they do change their leaves, you know, their needles fall off and get regrown, but it doesn't happen as one big leaf dump. And so the, the Yellowstone forest was green all the time. And when you look at the parkway, a lot of people that come in the summertime see that sea of green as well. But there is a little secret, a little hidden gem that comes out in October where that green fades in the sunshine and the chlorophyll breaks down and the yellows and the reds are revealed from underneath that and gives us that explosion of fall colors. Um, it's almost like the world pauses, waiting for what's to come in the future. You know, you can see yourself, uh, you know, kind of checking the clock, calling the park, when is the peak color gonna be? That's sort of the million dollar question everybody wants for their trip planning. And what you're waiting on is all of those experiences that come in the fall with the leaf drop, with the color change. And that's one neat thing that the parkway provides is it's sort of like a hiking trail for cars. It lets you uh, experience a lot of different landscapes uh, from the comfort of your vehicle. I'm always wondering what's the experience around the next bend. The fall colors start out kind of slow, you know, and every year I find myself thinking, is it early? Ah, oh, is it going to happen early? Is it late? When's it going to be? And that's part of the reason that I started taking pictures once a week at that time lapse site is to try and track and go back and compare. And I'll show you some of those images. But as those leaves start to change, then certain species of trees start to change. And you see things like dogwoods and sourwoods and the red maples with a tree changing color here and a tree there. Um, you know, as the days wear on, then you start to get more trees that are starting to change. Um, pretty soon hillsides start to change and you see these little pockets of color. And right now around my post 20 to 23, uh, some of those hillsides are really starting to come into some nice colors. And then for a very brief time period, you get all the mountainsides that are in color. Um, you get all these different species that are interacting, getting ready for winter. You can see the evergreens mixed in there. As the days get colder, days get shorter, eventually you're gonna have a storm system that'll move through. And that kind of signals the end for a lot of those leaves that get blown down. And unfortunately, other people call this past prime, oh, it's not worth going to see anymore. And I think, you know, every single day, no matter how many leaves are on the trees or what color they are, there's always something neat to experience that's here. And so it's never a boring landscape to me. And eventually I find myself wondering what species of tree will have the very last leaf to fall for the season. And I find myself now watching different trees and trying to track when the last leaf will drop uh, before the onset of winter and sort of the dormant period. The parkway offers you a, a front row seat, you know, a great place to go and experience this changing of the seasons every single year. Uh, no two days are alike, no two seasons are alike, no two years are alike either. Um, something I would encourage you to see while you're here, though, is the, the intense biodiversity. As Carolyn referenced it, the parkway ranks in the top five in terms of the national parks of the United States for biodiversity. There's just a tremendous variety of life that's here in all facets. Um, some things like insects and bacteria and, fungi, and fungi, we don't even know how many species of those particular organisms are within the park boundaries yet. We're still doing some inventory and monitoring on that. Uh, occasionally new species show up as well. Uh, and so you can see um, it's a place of continual change and to appreciate that biodiversity, you gotta kinda understand where it comes from and the significance of past events that shape our present day landscape is really important. Um, the underlying geology of the parkway is really crazy. Um, you know, they say that rocks are one of the few materials on the planet that has a memory that goes back over a billion years. Um, the core of the Blue Ridge up in Virginia is a volcanic rock that dates back 1.1 billion years. And sitting on top of that is a volcanic rock that extruded onto the landscape about 500 million years ago. Down in the valleys, you have all these sedimentary rocks, sandstones, mudstones, limestones. Um, it's a tremendous story about mountain formation and weathering that goes on. Um, these rocks have been twisted and tortured and uplifted and moved over time and weathered over eons of years. Um, the parkway spans 469 miles and uh, touches six different mountain chains on its winding way from Virginia down into North Carolina. Uh, the Blue Ridge, the Black Mountains, the Craggies, the Pisgahs, the Balsams, and ends at the Great Smokies. 
Along the way, you have a range of elevations that provide habitat for these species as well. Uh, the lowest place on the parkway is near milepost 63 at 649 feet, and the highest point in the parkway at Richland Balsam at milepost 431 is just over 6,000 feet. Gives you a range of about 5,400 vertical feet. Um, when you drive up in elevation, sometimes you don't notice the subtleties that happen. And we're going to take a trip up from James River to the top of Apple Orchard Mountain here. That's about 12 miles. It changes about 3,300 vertical feet. And as you drive up, particularly in the spring, it gives you an example of how the elevation impacts the climate and the weather of a particular location. You can see on this day, as you get up higher, you start to get a little change. It happens subtly. And if you're not paying attention, you can miss it. You can see when I left the low elevations at James River, about 62 degrees Fahrenheit, and arriving about a half hour later, it was 47 degrees at about 4,000 feet at mile post 77. And look at the difference between the low elevation plants and the high elevation plants in terms of their succession into spring uh, from winter. Uh, really makes a difference on what can live there in the climate and the weather patterns that are there too. Um, when I went to Alaska, the joke was that Alaska had four seasons. They would say that it had winter, June, July, and August because it could snow any day of the year. Here in the parkway, you might argue that we have four true seasons, uh, the, the spring wildflowers, uh, the summer and humidity and storms, you have the fall leaf color, and then you have a, a true winter here where it can get sub-zero occasionally up on the mountains as well. One of the things that's nice about the big, living in the southeast is we have a plethora of water that comes through and that helps keep this area nice and moist and uh, really make it easier for species to survive. We get somewhere between 40 and 45 inches of rain on average each year along the parkway in most locations and so a very wet location. Phoenix, Arizona by comparison has an average of nine inches of rain per year. So uh, very, very moist environment here on the parkway. Looking back to prior weather events though and in prior climate, really we are influenced by things that happened millions of years ago. When you look at the last ice age, uh, these great glaciers uh, moving down, being pushed uh, from accumulating snow down into areas like Pennsylvania. Now the ice never covered over into Virginia or North Carolina mountains, uh, but the fingerprints from those glaciers remained. When you get to the higher elevations like Mount Mitchell, uh, Mount Leconte, Klingman's Dome, pretty much areas starting at 4,500 feet and higher, you start to pick up the spruce fir forest. And in the higher elevations, it will be dominant and very reminiscent of what you would see in some of the northern uh, forests across Canada and Alaska, uh, mimicking Arctic species. When I was in Denali, the, there was only one reptile or amphibian in the entire six million acre park in Alaska. And it was the wood frog. And you could hear them calling in May as they were thawing out and breeding. And when I got to the parkway, I was hiking the AT uh, down near Bear Wallow Gap and happened to come across a wood frog that was breeding a big mass of them in an ephemeral pond and got some pictures of that. And the amazing thing is that these creatures are on the southern end of their range here on the Blue Ridge Parkway. This is an Arctic species that stayed in the mountains as the ice receded and the climate warmed. Um, they survived the winters actually by freezing solid, one big chunk of ice, and then thawing out the next year and carrying out their life cycle. It's really a remarkable adaptation to the cold, especially for a creature that's body temperature is based on what the temperature is outside. To contrast that, the low elevations mimic more of the tropics. And as the ice has receded starting about 20,000 years ago, the area has been warming and you see subtropical species, plants, animals move in. A great example of that is the opossum. Um, you can see that these creatures don't even have fur on their ears and their tail. And likewise, they don't do well in the Arctic environments. They get frostbite a lot of times and are not suited to the very cold climates. And so you see as the ice has receded, you see these tropical species moving up into North America, mixing with the Arctic species that have remained after the last ice age. And that's what really drives all of our biodiversity that's here. You know, that sea of green, it's very hard to recognize how many different species of trees that are in there when it's all green to the untrained eye, but it's very easy to pick up different species as they change to different colors in the fall. And that really helps, you know, reveal this tremendous biodiversity that we're fortunate enough to have. 
Um, the million dollar question I ask every year again is when should I come? When am I going to plan my trip from Europe or from Asia, Africa, um, you know, from South America? I want to be there at peak season. I want to be there on the best day to do that. And that's really hard to say because different species change uh, at different times, uh, different habitats change at different times, um, storms impact different areas of the parkway. And so keeping in mind that this particular um, series of Im images you're about to see is for a very particular site in Virginia, but it'll give you an idea of some of the consistencies and variations in changing fall color. Um, there's a fall foliage prediction map, if you haven't bookmarked that before, that you can find. And they predict when different um, peak color times might be for different areas of the United States based on past research and, and working with different agencies. And you can see the slider on the bottom that you can adjust that uh, depending on where you are uh, to figure out where, uh, when a good time to be uh, in an area for fall colors would be. So this is the site this year. I've got three pictures so far, but you can look at this picture. And what I'd like you to notice is the leaves in the canopy. Um, you'll see kind of the same view. 2012 is a little uh, different because that was the year I started this. Um, but pay attention to what's going on the forest floor. You saw kind of a choppy video. Uh, it was about 500 images I laid together trying to make a smooth video, but uh, playing over the web and through Zoom didn't seem to do it very well. Um, so this is a different attempt to show you kind of the same thing. When you look at this now, you can see the different years, 2012 through 2015 here of the same view, and you kind of get an idea. It's pretty similar. You go another four years, 2016 to 2019, you can see again how similar each year is. Still kind of green. You see some of the wildflowers on the ground are just starting to change colors a little bit. Um, this is the following week. So this is the, the end of September of 2020, and you can now compare that with other years and get an idea that, again, things are pretty similar um, in terms of what's going on on the forest floor and in the canopy over the years uh, at the end of September. This is the latest picture I got uh, last Friday, uh, looking at that same view. You can see we're starting to get a little more yellow in the canopy. You can kind of compare that. You see some of the understory here changing, but still kind of green uh, going on. And then uh, again, early October, we're looking at 2016 to 2019. It really, for this particular site, you can see by the time we reach middle of October, you can see the number of leaves pick up on the forest floor. Uh, you can see some of the leaves changing a little more yellow that's showing up by mid-October. And what I usually tell people is it's not really until the middle towards the end of October that I tend to think of the Ridge District at least starting to get in what we would think of as peak color. Now there's other areas like in North Carolina that may pass peak color in early October particularly at some of those higher low elevations, places that get really high winds that blow through. Um, but you can see here now towards the end of the month, this would be what I would consider peak color on this particular site, where you have a lot of leaves are down on the ground now. You used to have some leaves in the trees. Um, right around Halloween seems to be kind of the, the magic point where you're gambling on no storm to blow the leaves down. Uh, but at the same time, that's when the leaves might be more and more trees in color if you look at early November by comparison, you can see a lot of the leaves are down on the ground now. Um, there's a few still left in the trees, but by the 4th or the 5th of November, it's, it's pretty sparse uh, for leaf color up in the canopy. And by middle of November in this particular site, it's all done with most of the time. All the leaves are out of the trees. Uh, storm has blown them down and we're sort of past fall color. And so the parkway, what's interesting about it is that the parkway contains a motor road that allows you to explore these different landscapes at speed. It gives you that flexibility to go around the next corner and find what you're looking for. Um, one of the big things I would encourage you to think about is that the park, uh, each park contains an ecosystem that has processes to it. Um, those processes are the result of past influences, uh, whether it's weather and climate or geology, uh, animal migrations, um, humans moving around, but that biodiversity is really fragile too. There's, you don't want to remove species from an environment, for example, as they each play a role in that system and then the processes that made the place the what it is that you experience. The other thing that a lot of people don't think about is you don't want to add species to biodiversity either because uh, non-native species can come in and take over and completely dominate an area and change what you loved about it and ruin the processes that are there. And so Parks 9, in addition to preserving the landscape and the objects, also preserve the processes that make them special, predator-prey relationships, wildfire regimes, uh, 
when you think about forest succession, decomposition, and you know soil formation. There's so many different natural processes that are preserved inside parks as well that it's important to look at them as a whole. What happens in the boundaries of the park is also affected by what happens outside the boundaries. You overlay on top of that the interactions of humans with the landscape, and that's one more thing that helps make that place special. In some cases where people have practiced restraint and preserved and protected these areas and let them run their natural courses, in other cases, we preserve areas that tell the story of how people have interacted with the landscape. Um, it's crazy and humbling to think that I live in a place that has Native American evidence that dates back 8,000 years here on the Blue Ridge Parkway, where people have formed these relationships with the landscape uh, over tremendous time periods. And then we think about uh, you know, the European contact in 1607 at Jamestown, and you have these small subsistence mountain farms taking over Native American farm fields. Um, and then you go forward a little bit more and you have millionaires that are starting to move into this landscape and develop vacation homes and second homes here in the mountains because they recognize uh, the value and the importance of having these tremendously uh, rich biodiverse places. And that's really what's neat about the National Park Service is that it preserves unimpaired uh, the natural and cultural resources and the values of these places for the benefit, enjoyment, and inspiration of this and future generations. Um, they really do preserve some of our most powerful memories, uh, some of our most extraordinary land natural landscapes and historical important lessons. And I think about in the end, the reason I show up for work is that there's going to be people that came after me to enjoy this place, just like I'm the benefit of people that came before me. And I try to think about what do I want them to experience? What sort of relationship do I want them to have with these special places? And what choices can I make that protect and preserve this place so they have the opportunity to learn to love it just as I have? I'm going to stop screen sharing here because we're running out of time and uh, see if we can answer any questions for folks. Peter, thank you so much. You have a, a career that one can be envious of, all those places you've seen and been and laid a footprint and a fingerprint upon. So thank you for your work that you have done and dedicated to the National Park Service. And we're happy that you're here doing that on the Blue Ridge Parkway now. <laughs> um, we have a... <laughs> we have a few questions. We have time for a few questions. And uh, as a reminder, we will send the webinar link out to everyone um, after it's over, probably tomorrow or the following day, you'll get a link and it will also be able to be found on our webpage on our YouTube channel. So we have a few questions and, and I know you said it was a million dollar question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So in Virginia, because I know that's where you're based and you work, and you said the colors along the whole length of the parkway are, are varied depending upon what region you're in. So in Virginia, can you recommend the best place to see the colors right now? Yeah, I think probably between my post 20 and 23 up around Bald Mountain, the St. Mary's Wilderness, that area tends to change a little bit earlier um, in the season, which means that in another week or two, it's going to have wind hit it and the leaves will be down. So um, that's where last week it was really starting to come in nice around James River, still pretty green. Okay, which is what you had said in your presentation that makes it so amazing is that no matter when one goes to see colors along the parkway, if you drive far enough, you'll probably get lucky. If you yeah. don't go in November, at the end of November, I think I saw not not to do that. <laughs> not on the trees, um, on the ground at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a, another question. What is your favorite tree and why? <laughs> That's a good question. You know, the one that I always come back to is the white oak. There's something about the shape of the leaves that it seems like a Disney cartoon to me or something that, you know, just more stereotypical forest those rounded little lobes on the leaves, the acorns, the bark pattern. It, I think that one has just stayed with me. But each tree, you know, it's like, you know, like the sequoias and the redwoods, you know, they have a special place. And then you look at things like the Tua poplar in the east, a towering tree, um, mangrove forest and all those prop roots, cypress trees. Uh, each one, it's hard to name a favorite, but the white oak always comes back when I think about what a tree is, that one stands out. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like trying to pick your favorite kid if you're a park interpreter, right, to pick your favorite tree. And one final question. You mentioned the wood frog and uh, when you first came here to the parkway and finding one in an ephemeral pond. 
Can you tell everybody what an ephemeral pond is? Yeah, so you have these places where the ground's frozen, these lowlands, and then you get snow and rain melt that come in and fill them up with water. And so the whole water, not all year, they sort of like wet for a short time and then they dry out, then they'll recharge. And uh, it's kind of spooky to think that this one is like the size of a dining room and, you know, a few inches deep. And these wood frogs are trying to complete their whole life cycle before this thing dries out, you know. And so having that water recharge and the snow melt at that time of year, there's a very specific combination of factors that lets them reproduce in that site at least. And uh, the fact there's no fish in it as well makes it an important place to reproduce. So your eggs and your babies aren't being eaten too. So um, you see that repeated all over across the parkway in these habitats where if you try to design it, it would be impossible to imagine where life is carrying out its life cycle. It's really fascinating. Wow, it shows the delicate balance that's found along these mountains and all the little hidden gems. Peter, thank you so much for sharing your images and your stories of the biodiversity found in the Blue Ridge Mountains with us. We so much appreciate it. And everybody go out and explore the Blue Ridge Parkway. It's a beautiful day to go see the colors. Thank you again for coming. Bye.